Dear friends, good evening. Welcome to our First Chamber Lecture Series. Tonight, we have concluded our seminar in Elemental Therapy. And now, let's move on into the expansion of some other subjects. Let's focus tonight on the organization of the psyche, which happens to be the title of tonight's lecture. And quoting the words of Master Samael Aumbeor, he says, when I speak about organizing the psyche, this must be adequately understood. We need to manage our energies. We need to learn how to use them, not identify. If there's any takeaway from tonight's lecture is, number one, do not fall into the trap of identifying. And number two, let's figure out together how is it that we can do that. So that we can understand how to get there. Let's trace it back to what happens with our evolution as we receive these human bodies. Because when a child is born, they're given a physical body. And Samael says, this physical body is given for free. There is <laughs> there's really nothing other here than an expression of love and kindness of our Divine Mother. So that we can continue doing the work that is necessary for the innermost. At the same time, the question may come along, what about those beings that have no interest in awakening? What about those interests that have no interest in self-realization? Well, these bodies are still given for free by the Divine Mother to those essences that have been incarnated here in the material plane. And whether our being is seeking to achieve self-realization in a way that is very active, or in a way that is intermittent, or none at all, we all go through the process of developing the sensual mind methodically. As children, well, it takes a little while for the eyes to develop. It takes a little while for us to be able to discern what is happening at the level of the ears. It has to take a little while for us to be able to calibrate our our taste buds so that we can make use of that sense of taste and of course the first sense that is intense from the very beginning is the sense of touch but nevertheless our five senses develop themselves slowly and it is through those external sensations those sensorial perceptions that we learn to elaborate concepts. And the key message here is that we start developing subjective rationality based on the unidimensional aspect of these considerations of what we like and what we don't like, what we find pleasurable and what we find unpleasurable. And here... Within this very little bit of information, we can see exactly where is it that we start becoming very influenced by impressions. Because when we speak in the pre-chamber of transforming impressions, we are speaking about what is it that our senses are perceiving. Because impressions are those things that come to the body and that we perceive them through the senses of the human machine. And what happens here is that this subjective rationality happens because we get here, of course, developing senses and completely unconscious. It is true that the consciousness within a child is fully awakened. The ego surrounds the child. But as the ego penetrates into the body of the child through that opening at the top of the head that we know as the door of Brahmarandra, by the time that the cranium seals its bones, the ego is completely within the body and with the lack of the necessary fundamental education. From a very young age, we as creatures do not know how is it that we can transform impressions. And so we start building our personality, holding the hand of Archangel Gabriel. And by the time that we get to seven years old and we hold on to the hands of Archangel Rafael, we start going to school. So we enjoy kindergarten, we enjoy elementary school, we go through high school, superior education. And the subjective reasoning continues to be fed 
And because that subjectiveness con continues to be built with everything that we are getting at school, well, this leads the intellect into absurdity. Some people will immediately debate, hold on a minute. All of these things that I perceive are objective because they are that. If we look at a table and you say a table and I say a table and we are in agreement that it is a table, well, yes, then it is a table and the table is thus real. And as a consequence, we are being objective. But this is also a way in which we can start playing with half-truths and half-deceptions. Because we may agree that the table is the table, and yet when we start looking at the attributes of the table, we can see the table is dark. Somebody would say, well, it is not that dark. <laughs> and the moment we start looking at characteristics, the things that make up the table itself, we start finding divergence in opinions. All of this subjective reasoning, the many opinions that we have, take our intellectual capacity into the space of the absurd. And this grows and can grow uncontrollably. Because we have known certain friends who, as they find themselves observing, challenging life situations, they will find ways to justify them. They will find ways to, uh, as, as they force themselves to find what is good in the bad or the bad in the good, they start coming up with artifices of the mind as a way to accept things that in reality are nothing more than the consequences of our poor decisions. So with this subjectiveness, the human being starts becoming void of the experience of that which is true. We start relying on the senses. If the senses do not perceive it, then we're not sure. And if we're not sure, we tend to downplay it and we eventually start shutting down many of the great miracles of creation that exist around us. And that when that happens, well, then the objective reasoning is not developed. And it is our responsibility at this level of study to start helping develop the superior instruction that is necessary for our children because the current education system is unable to provide that. Now, one of the most beautiful attributes of a child is the capacity of amazement, of asking questions that are so profound and that we don't tend to perceive them because we take things for granted. What are dreams? What are thoughts made of? What thinks within me? These are all phenomenal, sensational questions. But the capacity of amazement starts getting lost. And it becomes less and less the more that we focus on the development of the sensual mind. And our current educational system then gives us back five things that we uh, have to deal with because they complicate our existence. Number one, they start planting seeds of falsehood in the five cylinders. Some of these seeds of falsehood are, if you cannot touch it, if you cannot feel it, if you cannot see it, it is a figment of your fantasies, of your imagination. If we cannot detect it with some instrument that is nothing more than uh, an apparatus that magnifies your senses, then it must not exist. And if that doesn't, if, and if that is the case, then there is something that may not be right with you. Because we go through difficult circumstances as we, as we share some of our experiences, and those experiences become downplayed by others. That starts minimizing our capacity of amazement. When we observe the beauty of a flower and we observe it in amazement, then it, it, it shocks us deep in the consciousness and we would like to share that same sense of joy with somebody else. Whenever they say, it's just a flower, eh, they invalidate immediately our experience and then we start shedding away our capacity of amazement. 
which is a good reason why Samael emphasizes that all of this work is esoteric work. If contemplating a sunrise fills you with abundant joy and happiness, there is no need except to enjoy it. No need to force anyone else to try to experience what you are experiencing because we're all operating at different levels of being. Rather, enjoy it and through the result of your enjoyment, through those actions and expressions of enjoyment, then allow others to experience it vicariously through you rather than trying to replicate your own experience in somebody else. Because there are seeds of falsehood deposited into our five cylinders. And because we have seen reduce the capacity of our amazement, we start then exaggerating the capacity of the sensual mind. And as a consequence, we end up creating a false personality. First person, a personality that depends on whatever the senses can perceive and that is entirely given as an instrument to the ego. And the key takeaway here is that the sensual mind cannot transform us. It will not take us out of our current state of mechanicity. We have to take our mind and the chaos that exists within it, heavily induced by our reliance on the sensual mind, and we have to organize our psyche. Somehow else says, if you organize your psyche, you can give form to the psychological man. And this brings uh, to good use Pietro Ruspensky's quote, that the exterior is a reflection of the interior. <coughs> Let's look around us. Let's look at what is happening within our house. Our house as a symbol of where our consciousness dwells, our body. And let's see what is happening within our house. Where is it that we're seeing the clutter? Where is it that we are seeing the accumulation of dirt and dust? Because in those areas that tend to be hidden from sight, areas that we do not visit frequently, we will start seeing that there is some good housekeeping that must be done as well within our own mind. <laughs> One time we were sharing this and somebody asked the question, but what happens if I am bringing people at home to help me clean? And even though I don't see it, it is clean. Is it still a reflection of my mind? And the answer is yes. And this is as we live in a dream where we can apply the very law of opposites. And we can say, if we look outside of us and everything is organized, Everything is clean and perfect. And at the same time, we are not doing the necessary work to transform ourselves internally. Then the law of opposites is telling us this degree of organization is what you are missing inside of you simply for not applying yourself and working in the transformation of the consciousness. So there is this quote within some else writing that states, the sensual mind is a declared enemy of the superior mind. And we can see this in our daily doings. If we are very hungry and we go to the supermarket, the moment that we start seeing the produce and the meats and the pastries and everything else, we start identifying ourselves with those succulent ingredients with those succulent cakes and pastries and drinks. And we end up buying things that may not necessarily be what is truly what the body needs. We identify and we fascinate with the shock that we receive from those impressions. And we drift into our vigil state, dream state, into what we would love to have. And that is exactly what we get. Sometimes we just tend to overeat simply because we are too hungry and we start nourishing ourselves with things that are not necessarily what benefit the body the most. If we happen to be at a party and somebody is offering us a cup of wine or a beer, if we 
go with the shocks that are received by the sensual mind and we identify with the beer, we may end up having a few beers or a few six packs or a few cases after a couple of hours and eventually get ourselves into trouble. If we see someone who is interesting, we may identify with their intellectual discourse. We may identify with the way that they look, with the way that they dress. And soon enough, in that sleep of the consciousness, we will start fantasizing on which words I can steal so that I can sound like them. Which fashion are they embracing so that I can replicate that and start looking more like them. And this all starts with the problem of identifying with things of receiving an impression through the senses and let it flow as if it were irrelevant and unimportant. We need to be able to start this work and to do so, Samael tells us, we must never identify with any circumstance and we must rely on self-observation. These days where people speak so much about the law of attraction, and that they assign so many great attributes to the law of attraction, and so many false capabilities to the human being. Samael tells us, there are societies, schools, communities, that pretend to organize the human psyche through certain golden rules to achieve purification, to achieve sainthood, etc. There are societies that will invite many of their students to spend endless hours in meditation, endless hours chanting mantras, endless hours doing certain specific exercises. And after a few weeks, a few months of heavy investments of all of that creative energy, vocalizing and exercising and moving and, and doing these mystical practices, they come to find themselves in the same situation when they started. They come to see themselves even in some circumstances, even drained of their energy, realizing where has all of this effort gone? Samael tells us, obviously, no, not one of such golden rules could become a template to address life's different happenings. Because to subjugate ourselves to such would be absurd, as obviously it would turn us into slaves so those golden rules will never transform anyone. We used to have a close friend who, learning about the law of attraction, he decided that he was going to rely on affirmations. And his affirmation, he always wanted to, to put his hands on a substantial amount of money. And he started uh, saying, I want a million dollars, I want a million dollars. And he resorted to writing these affirmations. And methodically, he started filling up the walls in his cubicle at work with yellow notes, sticky notes. I want a million dollars. I want a million million. I want a gazillion dollars. And after many, many years, of course, the situation did not change. Just because we wake up in the morning and we say, I am not going to get angry, you will walk the day able to dominate your anger. Just because you wake up in the morning saying, today I'm going to be a better person, that does not guarantee that you will go through the day and become a better person indeed. Because there has to be a constant watch for what is influencing the human machine. We can say as many affirmations as we want. But affirmations by themselves, they will never transform anyone. For us to be able to organize our psyche, Samael says, look at the facts. Face your defects as they really are. He is inviting us to not be justifying our mistakes. He is asking of us to not be hiding our mistakes because of shame or just to not address them and think them that if we don't think of them that they will eventually go away we have to look at the facts and that requires of us to exercise some serious analysis 
we have to be more judicious, we have to be more comprehensive. And self-observation for this purpose is fundamental. But what exactly is it that this means? When it comes to serious analysis, what exactly does this mean? And we share this with you here in the first chamber. Because what we have learned is that with the fundamentals of transforming impressions of the pre-chamber, many students remain stuck at the level of the intellect. And when it comes to this serious analysis, what they try to do is to intellectually understand the defect. That means use the mind to understand the mind. And this is very difficult. This is very challenging to the mind because the aspect of you that is looking at that defect today may not be looking at that defect again in an indefinite amount of time. What we are seeking to do here is to embrace those three elements that are crucial for initiation. Objective imagination, inspiration, and intuition. Because we have to go beyond the capability of the mind. So when Samael says we need serious analysis, he is not asking you to sit there with your eyes closed thinking about you did, what you could have done, what should have happened because that becomes a waste of time. What he is asking of you to do is to remain calm so that you can listen to the voice of the innermost, so that you can use your faculty of clairvoyance, the objective imagination, so that you can relive the event through your exercise of retrospection. And the moment that you empower the consciousness to make use of its intuition, of its inspiration, it will naturally embrace the principle of spontaneity and tell you what is the meaning of what happened, what are the reasons behind what happened, and what is the spiritual reality behind the actions, thoughts, and sentiments of that defect. And that looks something like this. As you are doing your exercise in retrospection, you come to realize that you did something during the day that you hurt the feelings of someone at home, someone that you love, someone that you have emphatically demonstrated love to many times. And the moment that you see the consequences of your actions and how they bring affliction to someone else, the moment that you can see how is it that your thoughts started generating inferior emotions that materialized as rolling of the eyes or walking away or punching things or clenching your fists or grinding your teeth or just uh, smashing a door, things like these, you can start seeing what is the effect of all of that in the psyche of the people that you love. And you can immediately apprehend the spiritual reality of the suffering that they experience. Friends, when you see people who are really suffering, and you see that they are suffering as a consequence of your own actions, you start bringing that feeling and experiencing it deep within your heart. And when that experience is there, that serious analysis allows you to be more judicious and to understand clearly why is it that you shouldn't be doing that. Because then the experience of the suffering of others becomes real to you by virtue of that direct experience. But if you sit down and you start thinking, yeah, they look sad. Yeah, I shouldn't do this. That was not right. That is not enough. That is too superficial. That is too incipient. We have to rely on self-observation. Look at what Samael says. He says, There are plenty of our Gnostic brothers, and of course sisters, who discover a defect, and with their theoretical mind, they start speculating. And this is very grave. We cannot be thinking, Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but the problem is, is that they said this, and it's their fault. And before we realize, we are so deep, identified with our own mental formations, 
that we just go into a space of fantasy creating all of these elaborate dramas in our head. And they, at the end of the day, they pay nothing back to us. This is why we are so fortunate to have powers superior to the mind available to us here and now. And an example of this is our Divine Mother Kundalini. And we see her here as the Greek goddess Diana. But we speak of Kundalini, but of course we also have our internal Kaom, the internal police of karma. We have our internal guardian angel that speaks through the silent voice of the heart. We have the maiden of memories. We have Morpheus. We have the seven degrees of fire. We have the elemental gods of nature that they can all communicate to us and give us insight on what is happening at any given moment and at any given circumstance. But if we are to focus on our Divine Mother, our Divine Mother who is the essence of the Christic fire, once we work with our Divine Mother, as we ask of her, not only to guide us, not only to protect us, but as we work with our Divine Mother and invoke her, asking, Divine Mother, show me everywhere where I have been in agreement to say these things, where I have been in agreement or where I have encouraged others to think in this way, to populate those inferior thoughts, those inferior emotions, to just make them common and normalize them, you will suddenly start seeing moments in which you behave that way, moments in which you saw the example of others and you took it as a good example, Moments in which you encouraged others and you even mocked others for not doing things in this or in that way. <coughs> and as you start seeing all of those places where that took place, what you are indeed doing is opening doors within the, the edifice of the mind, within that building, that internal psychological city, you're opening doors and you're finding all of these residues, all of these fragments of these psychological aggregates where the consciousness is trapped. And when we ask our Divine Mother to help us eliminate this, as we penetrate deeper and deeper into the 49 levels of the consciousness, we start seeing the liberation of the consciousness. The ultimate result of liberating the consciousness is incarnating the Christ. And we spoke of this <clears throat> in one of our other First Chamber lectures. We need to replace the I-Self with the I-Christ. And the only way we can do that is by working with safeguarding our creative energies by transmuting our waters and allowing the essence, the cosmic essence of the Christ that exists within our Anseminis to be able to form itself and become that I Christ. The same thing happens with the cosmic substance of the Holy Spirit so that we can fabricate, crystallize, materialize within us the I Holy Spirit or the individual and in particular Holy Spirit within each and every one of us. Because it is within those very same cosmic essences that faculties, virtues, abilities, powers, laws, bodies, all of these things come together and make up the solar soul. These are the cities. These are the luminar faculties that flourish within the psyche. But we have to work with the Divine Mother so that she helps us find things, so that she helps take of our creative energies and what we have transmuted, that she can take it and through her flaming spear of arrows work to reduce that into a cosmic dust. But what happens if we are not paying attention during the day? If we are not watching the impressions that are coming to us? Well, we keep reacting, and if we keep draining our energy needlessly, then what is left available for our spiritual work? Exactly, the answer is nothing or very little. 
And then the progress that we make becomes minimal when we could have possibly done more. Samael tells us in his works, the reason for illumination is Dharmadhatu. And Dharmadhatu is many things. Let's, if, if we were to say that Dharmadhatu is the absolute manifestation of that, that is Dharmadhatu. If we were to say Dharmadhatu is the cosmic intelligence of creation, that is Dharmadhatu. If we were to say Dharmadhatu is the, the, the cosmic wisdom of creation, that is Dharmadhatu as well. If we say Dharmadhatu is the pillar of mercy and it's the pillar of severity, yes, that is true, that is Dharmadhatu. And the only reason for illumination is that the experience of that absolute expansion because that leads to the radical illumination. And there is no way that we can get to that until we deal with the third factor of the revolution of the consciousness and that is the sacrifice for others. We have to stop thinking that sacrificing for others is saying, I have to take time so that I can go and dedicate three or four hours at the food pantry. Because that is necessary. If you can do that, by all means, go and do that. But we cannot just think that sacrifice is something external, something that we have to get in some kind of to-do list. Because that is not what the practice is. The practice is our own life. And when we are observing ourselves, when we are making an effort to not identify with the impressions that are coming to us, then we are diving into the sacrifice. Because remember that sacrifice is the sacred office. It is the sacred work. And this is a work of fire. Why is it a fire? Because we are protecting our internal fire. We are protecting the source of those waters that bring the fire alive in each and every one of us. And we have said a lot about the sensual mind thus far. We do not want you to think that we have to get rid of the sensual mind. Because the sensual mind is super important. If there were no sensual mind and you had no sense of touch, you would get into the shower, not know if you had opened the hot water, and you would burn yourself. And of course, that would be entirely detrimental. If you had no sense of smell, you would walk into a place where there has been a release of gas or paint and you would not smell it. You would contaminate yourself. You, we, the exposure would be so aggressive that you could overdose and die instantly. Of course, that would be detrimental because you need this vehicle for the work. So we are not saying the sensual mind is bad. No. Everything in its orbit is useful. Like Samael says, the fire in the kitchen, phenomenal. The fire in the living room, it's a big problem. He also says water in the shower is great, but water in the living room, it damages the house. So we have to bring our sensual mind back into the orbit in which it is truly useful. Because the sensual mind says, hey, the machine is hungry, feed it. So we feed it. You put your hand on the hot stove and it tells you that is hot. It's going to damage the machine. So you get your hand out and you don't allow that to happen again. It reminds you to take action and satisfy the responsibilities, to get dressed, to pay your rent. It helps you to deal with the responsibilities of life. So we have to learn to manage the sensual mind intelligently. And to dominate the sensual mind we need to empower the consciousness. We see this in the cosmic drama of the great master, Yeshua ben Pandira. Because Yeshua, that in Hebrew means the Savior, well, we know that in this drama, he represents many things. He also represents our internal Savior, and that is the consciousness. And he speaks to this tempting agent, this angel, fallen angel of darkness, Yahweh, he says, Satan, Satan, it has been written, you will only obey and adore the Lord, your God. So that means that the consciousness needs to be aware so that we can see the tricks of the ego, 
so that we can learn to decipher the, the sagacity of that inferior mind of the ego because the ego is super clever. You know, the ego starts working in ways that are so subtle that before you realize, you find yourself in a deep slump, infested with problems. We have to expect the moment that we decide to be maintaining this heightened degree of awareness, a tremendous internal rebellion. And what will happen is that you will try to maintain some awareness and you will notice that during the day, you're not aware more than 10 seconds. You say, I'm going to be fully aware. And you're looking at something and a song comes around and it reminds you of a better time. <sniffs> Done. Identified, fascinated, sleep of consciousness. And you say, Whew. two hours later, whoa, wait, I forgot. I forgot to remain uh, in the present moment. How do I do this? Uh, and then you, you try to centralize yourself, or center yourself again. And as you're doing this, you smell something delicious. And you identify, fascinate. Before you realize you have had more calories in a single seat sitting than what you would need for the whole day. And then you think again, well, what happened? So how is it that we can maintain this awareness? Friends, the key here is that we need to empower the innermost to be the dominant entity within ourselves every given moment. This is something that we do by the practice of the key of SOL. And the key of SOL is easy. Some people say it doesn't work for me because they are focusing on the mind. We cannot try to split ourselves between the observer and what is being observed because that creates conflict in the mind. What Samuel is telling us with the key of SOL is empower the consciousness imagination intuition inspiration and when we're dealing with the key of sol we need to bring ourselves to a level of awareness where we see any impression any impression anything that comes through the senses and we look at it as if it were no and as we are doing this, we are aware that the human machine is perceiving. This is not the mind thinking. This is the consciousness present. Just as when we are doing our exercise of relaxation, where we bring our attention to our feet, and we know that our feet are there. Where we bring our attention to our knees, our heels, our shins. And even as we say this, likely you are feeling the sense of relaxation slowly creeping up on you. That is because we're empowering the consciousness to perceive. And when the consciousness is perceiving the human machine, it detects the impressions that are coming to you. So you can see the impression and the effect of the impression. And at that moment, you need to make sure that you answer yourself the question, where am I? Pull that finger and make it a habit. Because when that finger stretches, you know very well that you are in the astral plane. And the habits that we create here, we carry them when we unfold in the dream state. So we have to expect this battle. This battle is going to be a pain because this is the sensual mind. This is the intermediate mind. This is the mind of the ego just doing all of its churning and battling and comparisons. We have to allow the consciousness just to simply be there and perceive. Good example of this, Samael shares it as one of those events when he found himself in a car. He was with friends. They were going to somewhere in Mexico. And he's saying, you know, we were driving down the highway. And this lady, who happened to be in the farthest most left lane, she decided that she needed to take a right. Actually, from the farthest right lane, she, needs, she needed to take a left. And from there, she cut into traffic and she caused an accident. The lady started accusing the driver in the car where Samael was. It is your fault. The guy is saying, what do you mean? Are you crazy? You must be out of your mind. You come from out there. You get in my lane. I hit you. I did not expect you to be there. The other passenger, they start teaming up. And while all this is happening, Samael walks 
to the walks to the shoulder of the road and he sits under the shade of a tree relaxes his body contemplates after an hour or two hours of arguing the lady wanted to bring the cops she wanted to bring people to the the, the court let the judge see it Samuel asked how much is it something like 300 pesos Samuel gave her 300 pesos. His friends looked at him. What are you doing? You know that she is she is guilty of this. It's her responsibility. Samuel else thinks. You know what? If I had not given her those $300, we'll still be ad- arguing. You would still be wasting of your energy trying to have someone see a perspective. That is the same as imposing our view. And it may be true that they were in the right, but the fact is is that our levels of being are so different that sometimes reality for some people can be a forced perspective. And whenever we're forcing things into someone's mind, we're teetering into the space of black magic. You see, this is very clear when someone else says, Delinquency hides itself behind the smoke of the incense of prayer. So we cannot identify ourselves with the circumstances. Because we just waste energy and we need to safeguard this energy. If we identify with the circumstances and we explode in anger, then the question is, what energies are we going to use so that we can unfold in our astral body? Because the energy is not going to be there. If we are going to try to create an individual mind, and during the day, we're constantly burning our intellectual energy, thinking, oh my God, the politics, or oh my God, what am I going to (laughs) cook? Or what happened? Do you remember what they said and and what I did? Or look at this post that I have on Facebook. How can I say that I am so ashamed? When we burn our intellect in that, where is going to be the energy left so that we can crystallize an individual mind? If we are living life and we don't stop looking at people and saying, oh, look at that person. Who's that? I don't know, but look at them. Because this is what we do. We thrive on these mechanical antipathies. We see them. Oh, I don't like them. Who's that? I have no idea. Why don't you like them? I don't know. Look how they walk. Look how they look. Look at the way that they look. Look at the way that they dress. Listen what they're saying. Look at their gestures. This, this is all what the mind does. And all along, what we're seeing there is just a reflection. Stuff that we dislike about ourselves. Things that we don't even want to face, but we're just seeing it reflected in others. So if we just keep doing that, and we keep having all of this inferior will, this ill will towards others, then how is it that we can create a solar body of conscious will? We can't. If we forget about ourselves, we identify. When we identify with impressions, with the circumstances around us, we cannot give any form to our psyche. We become completely unable to intelligently structure the psyche simply because we are wasting our energy. If there is no sacrifice, there is no condensation of these energies around us. If we are not involved in the sacred work, the sacred office, the sacrifice, these superior energies do not crystallize around us and there is no canvas for us to be able to pencil away our superior work. If we are wasting our energies, those egos are becoming stronger Our consciousness is further suppressed and we fall deeper into the sleep of consciousness. So Samael says it is urgent for us to understand this. This is what organizing the psyche means. 
We have to make an effort and stop identifying with stuff. The interior man is what is important. Samael tells us, The creation of man is fundamental and achieved only through the organization of the psyche. Yet there are many who rather than dedicating themselves to the organization of their psyche, they worry about the development of inferior powers. And this is absurd. It is a waste of time. How exactly does that look like? Well, we know of good friends who uh, for one reason or another, they willingly sit, relax their body, and they can spend two or three hours of the day singing mantras. E E O U A. They seek to bring this harmonious vibration in those five centers of the human machine. The chakras of the head, the chakra of the throat that gives the faculty of the inner ear, the chakra of the heart, the O and the A vibrate in the heart because the O allows for the vibration of the cardias and the A allows for the vibration of the thymus gland that is associated to the heart. Of course, the chakras of the lungs vibrate and allow for better absorption of prana, but nevertheless, the heart. The, the, the U as U, well, it vibrates on the solar plexus, <clears throat> giving us better reception for telepathy. So they do this, and they want to be clairvoyant. They want to be omniscient. They want to be able to hear the ultra. They want to be able to communicate telepathically. And they will burn two or three hours of a day singing mantras to awaken those inferior powers. And outside of those hours, somebody sends them a text message, and they crumble, or they react violently, or they are worried, they are suspicious, all of this. And then... How can we create an interior man if we, rather than organizing the psyche, we are just seeking to create some silly powers that we are not even going to know how to use? Because as long as you have ego, you can have all the magical ear that you want. But the ego is still there to incorrectly translate what you are hearing. And any student at this level who knows how to do a good consultation of the tarot knows this. Because you can take readings and you can look at readings of others. And once that consultation is displayed, you can say, I know what that is saying. But the moment that you ask a question and the moment that you get that reading back, the ego immediately starts playing its tricks. And you may know exactly what it says there, but then you start looking for ways to evade the, the, the rough message. Yeah, but maybe that is not what that means, you see? This is what the ego does. And if it does that to us in something as simple as making use of our sense of sight, how much more is it not going to twist reality when we start hearing, listening to the ultra, seeing clairvoyantly things that we don't know if they are in present time or if we are witnessing an event that happened lives ago. This is why Samael says this is a waste of time. Even Einstein stated the only real valuable thing is intuition. It is thinking without thinking. It's allowing for that instinctive ability of the consciousness to receive and interpret and understand all of these cosmic truths. And somebody else says, what is intuition? <laughs> intuition is the faculty of interpenetration. And this requires a good deal of meditation. At the time that you decide to meditate today, offer this to your innermost. Father, show me what is interpenetration. And you will be able to understand in depth the true meaning of intuition, the significance, the reasons of things, because you can see reflections, chains of causes and effects there's a beautiful story Samael shares with us of an empress who seeks for one of the higher priests and says, Master, show me what is interpenetration. And the priest collected ten mirrors and he set them on a circle, allowing only for a small space between two of the mirrors. And right at the center, he placed a candle. 
when it went dark. And the princess looked through the slit. What she saw is something similar to what you see here on your screen. The very same source of light reflected infinitely. To depths of perception that not even the eyes could perceive. And this is exactly what interpenetration is. Because our life experience is based on these interpenetrations. There are seven orders of worlds. And we know that there is the Iocosmos, the Protocosmos, there's the Macrocosmos, the Mesocosmos, the Deuterocosmos, the Microcosmos, and there's even the Tritocosmos or, or the Underworld. And these are not worlds that exist one there and one there. One below us, one above us, you know, somewhere beyond the, the clouds, uh, in that space where, where the blue of the sky and the darkness of the voidness of space, you know, come together. It is not that. These are concentric spheres where one is inside the other and they occupy themselves all of this space, and even in that overlapping, there is no interference. Because even these spheres, because they are not solid and they don't have a definitive limit, they blend with each other and allow for the manifestation of different laws. This degree of mutual interpenetration <laughs> Is what we're seeking to comprehend. Because when we have intuition and we enjoy the faculty of interpenetration, we can perceive what exists within the densest of those spheres as much as the vastness of the expansion for as much as our level of being allows us to expand. Every expansion requires a degree of mastery. And we know that there are Buddhas of compassion and there are Buddhas of contemplation. The Buddhas of contemplation are called Buddhas Paratiekas. They take the spiral path of their liberation. And Samael says that is a path that is longer, but it's also a path that brings about less suffering. Buddhas Paratiekas are great masters like Wewetheol, Agni, the god Indra, the powerful master, Parvati, Paralda, Kitichi, Gob, Arvarman, etc., etc., etc. And then there is the direct path, a path that is shorter towards the absolute, but that comes loaded with substantial more sufferings. And the decision to take the spiral path or the vertical path, direct path, is not yours. It is a decision that comes from the innermost. Nevertheless, the Buddhas that take the vertical path, that direct path to the Absolute, those are Buddhas Maitreyas. And between these two Buddhas, well, Samael speaks about the Buddhas of contemplation, the Buddhas Paratyekas. And he says, if all creatures can be reflected in the mind of a Buddha of contemplation, because he has no more psychological aggregates to eliminate, then... He achieves through intuition that which we could define as omniscience. That is the interpenetration. When those 49 levels of the mind are clear, and when you rely on that faculty of that consciousness, in this case, of a solar consciousness to expand, it allows you to perceive from the deepest, densest levels to the highest levels of manifestation. And this is what we're seeking. And this is entirely achievable. But what is it that we, where is it that we need to start? We don't have to start in affirmations. We don't have to start dedicating countless hours to awaken certain faculty or the other. We have to start... By not identifying. We have to start seeking to not identify so that we would not fascinate and fall into the sleep of consciousness. How do we not identify? 
Again, let's make a conscious effort throughout the day to remind ourselves that it is our innermost, the dominating entity that must exist within us, so that we make ourselves an instrument at its service. Let's keep in perspective our Divine Mother. And rather than being debating with the, the garbage of the mind, let's invoke our help so that we can see everywhere where we have agreed to those things that we judge in others. Where we have encouraged others to do so. Where we have seen that as the right thing to do. And slowly start cleaning up from within those 49 levels. Dear friends, we are sharing this with you from Samael's very own lecture titled The Organization of the Psyche. And of course, we're very grateful to all these sources because through them, we got the images necessary to put this material together. So dear friends, this has been our lecture, The Organization of the Psyche. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And may all beings be happy. Be happy.